community would like to invite Ajahn to come to Indonesia for half a day Dhamma talk and three days retreat. After that, we will arrange to visit Borobudur and visit Mandut Temple where the relics of the late Supreme Patriot, His Holiness Somdet Prakyana Samwon is placed. We will suit the program with Ajahn's schedule. We hope to have this invaluable chance and looking forward for the good news so we can make the preparation. I am sorry I cannot accept the invitation because uh, I'm, I am an undocumented person. I have no legal document. So if I have to travel, I have to go get all the documents, which is a lot of uh, work for me. And I, I just prefer not to travel anymore. So I can only give Dhamma talk by YouTube or by Facebook. So you have to listen to my Dhamma talk that way. Okay. Question number two from Singapore, from J. Lo. Uh, Ajahn Lee Damadaro mentioned that we should fix our concentration at the tip of our nose and yet also maintain a broad awareness of the breath feeling in our body. Does this mean that we should focus our attention on two objects, which is the breath at the nose tip and broad awareness of breath within the body? I think you should only focus on one thing. At the tip of the nose will be better because you want to unify the mind into becoming one. If you have the mind go to, uh, to separate locations, then the mind will not be unified. The mind will not come to full complete calm. Can you share a simile on how to balance these meditation objects? A. Is it like a magnifying glass where we focus exclusively on the breath and alternate with awareness of breath in body? Or B. Is it like a driving a car where we focus our sight on the road, which is on the breath in front of us, and occasionally glance at the rear mirrors to steer the car? No, you don't want to go away from the breath at all. You want to be with the breath all the time in order to, for, the, for the mind to become totally uh, concentrated. If the mind come and go here and there, it will not be able to concentrate into one. So you need to be fixed with on, only one place at the tip of the nose. Just watch the, mind, the breath there and don't let the mind go somewhere else. By switching the meditation object between the nose and broad awareness, can our mind fall into a state of single-pointedness? If you fix it on one point, yes. If you go to two different locations, then you will not become one-pointedness. Uh, one okay. So, question number three. It's about five aggregates. With the exception of form, I always mix up and confuse with the others. Will Venerable Ajahn be able to explain the five aggregates and its subtle differences and share an example how best to differentiate between them? Well, the five aggregates are composed of two separate parts, the body part and the mental part. The form, which is the rupa aggregate, means the body. The body is made up of the four elements and it is impermanent, it rises and ceases. Once it is being born, it will get sick, get old and die. This is body. The other four, the Nama, Kanta, Vetana, Sanya, Sankhan, Vinyan, this is part of the mind. It, it comes with the mind. The mind is the one who knows. Besides being the one who knows, it also has feeling, has perception, has thinking, has uh, uh, vinyan, I mean awareness. See? So this, this, they belong to the mind. They, they are part of the mind. When the body dies, the other four still 
stay with the mind and go with the mind to a new birth, to to form and to get a new body. So this the four Namakanda doesn't die or disappear with the the body. The body disappear, return to the four elements. Why the Namakanda, Vetana, Sanya, Sankhan, Vinyan is part they are part of the mind. So they go with the mind to a new existence. Question number four. <coughs> In the five aggregates of consciousness, which is vinyana, how is it different from jitta, the one who knows? The one who knows, knows all the time. Why, why the, the vinyana consciousness is the consciousness to the senses. When the eye see the form, the consciousness arise and accept and being conscious of that form. Like when you see a, a picture, you see a person, then the consciousness also arises. See, the, the consciousness of the vinyana is the one that receives the picture from the eyes and transport it to the mind, to the one who knows, to the citta. And then, once it gets to the citta, to the one who knows, the perception comes into play. When you see someone, sanya start to go into your memory to find out who is this person that you see, whether you know him or not. See. If you know him, then you will have a certain feeling toward that person. Vetana will come up. If the person you know was good to you, you will have good feeling. If the person you know was bad to you, then you have bad feeling. And after you have this good or bad feeling, then Sankhara comes into play. Sankhara will say, if he's good, then I should go see him, go, go talk to him. If he's bad, I should get, avoid him, go somewhere else. Yeah. This is how the four Namakanda works. First, through the consciousness. The Vinyana go is the one that transports the information from the body, from the eyes, ears, nose, and tongue. This, the, this is the function of the vinyana. It transports the information that the, the body sends to the mind. The body see a picture, the body send this picture to the mind by consciousness. By Vinyana is the one that picks up this picture. And then it's sent to sanya, perception. Sanya check the old memory bank, whether the, this picture we have of this person or not. If we have, then we know whether he's good or bad. If he's good, then you have good feeling. If he's bad, you have bad feeling. Seems first you have vinyan, then you have sanya, then you have vetana, then you have sankhara. See, once you know this person is good, you have good feeling. When you have good feeling, sankhara will say, "Okay, let's go invite him, say hello to him." If you know that he's bad, he hurt you in the past. And Sankhara will say, oh, better stay away from me. So this is how the, the four Namakanda works. They, they work as a team, and they work very fast. And this is just a, a sort of a, a microscopic picture, but in real life it's just instantaneously. When you hear something, you already, all the other, everything comes into play right away. The feeling, the perception, the Sankhara comes into play right away. But this is just a, a sort of a dissection of the the way how these things work. First, is the sanya, is the vinyana, the consciousness that pick up the information that the the bodies pick up from the external thing, like the picture, the sound, the smell, the taste. When 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 the body picks up this information, it sanya comes and take it to the mind, and not sanya, vinyana, consciousness, pick up, the, pick up the information from the body and send it to perception, send it to sanya. Sanya will then investigate, try to figure out what kind of picture, what kind of sound, good or bad. Once it, it knows whether it's good or bad, then it has feeling. If it's good, you have good feeling. If it's bad, you have bad feeling. If it's neutral, you have neutral feeling. 
And once you have this feeling, then you have sankhara. Start thinking, what should I do with this? Should I run away or should I welcome it? Yeah. So this is how the, the, the five khanda works together. You need the body to be the, 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 the thing that pick up all the information, the receptor, like the camera and the microphone. It, the camera picks up the picture, the microphone picks up the sound, then, then, when, then it's sent to the mind to process through perception, through sanya. If it's a picture you have never seen before, then you don't know whether it's good or bad. Then you don't have bad or good feeling. You just have neutral feeling. Then you have to think, what should I do? Should I go after it or should I just leave it alone? So it, this is how the, the five conduct works. And the chitta is just the one that knows. That, that knows everything. everything. Yeah. And then, then in the chitta, there is another thing. Then once, once you see something it likes, then the low part comes into play. The desire comes into play. When you see something you like, then you tell Sankara, go get it. Then this is low part, see. If you see something you don't like, then you tell Sankara, get rid of it. Yeah. This is uh, the, the opposite of low part. So that's the work of the chitta. That's the work of the that's chitta. The work of chitta. This is what you want to get rid of, is the lopa, tosa, and moha. Mm -hmm. You cannot get rid of the, the namakanda. Mm -hmm. the, the Buddha still had namakanda after he became enlightened. Mm -hmm. He still have the body, but he has no lopa, dosa, or moha mm -hmm. to direct the kanda. Mm -hmm. The kanda will, that will work according to uh, rationality. Whether if it's good, okay, do it. If it's bad, don't do it but no, not emotionally involved. Okay. Understand? Understand? Okay. Next. Um, okay. Right. Five, number five. Uh, okay, number five. Number five, question from Toronto, Ontario, Canada, from Miss Deborah. Mr. what? Miss Deborah. Deborah, Debbie. Which one from Debbie, Ontario? say hello to... Diana, she's Debbie here. From, from Canada also, right? Okay, Diana, say hello to Debbie. <laughs> Make noise. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Her question. I have been practicing mindful prostration, walking meditation, and sitting meditation with touching points. This technique does not emphasize jhana or absorption meditation. Is it possible to access insight directly through mindfulness, or is absorption meditation necessary? Before you can go to inside meditation, you need a clear and clean mind, a, a mind that is peaceful. So you need to have samadhi or absorption first. Mm -hmm. Because when, if your mind is not calm, your defilement will still be, uh, dis we can disturb you. But when you have a calm mind, clear mind, it means your, your defilement has been uh, reduced has not in, not eliminated, but has been uh, been cut down t in in strength. It doesn't have enough strength to come and disturb your investigation to see the truth of the 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 things that you want to see. Like you want to see anicca, dukkha, anatta. If your mind is not calm, then your defilement will come and say, "No, no, everything is good. Nothing is bad." It will try to argue with you. But if you have samadhi, then this argument will, will not be there. When you see anicca, you see anicca. If you see dukkha, you see dukkha. See? So first you need to subjugate the defilement by having samadhi or absorption. Once you have this, then you, then you can look at things as they are, not as what your, your defilement wants to look. Your defilement wants to see everything as nice and good. Yeah. But the truth is everything is not nice and good. But we cannot see that until it happens, see. Like when you have to have a boyfriend or a girlfriend, you think, oh, it's very nice to have them. But when you have them and then you run into argument, you run into uh, conflict, you know, then you say, oh, this is not so good anymore. See. 
So it's better to subjugate the defilement first before you can develop inside meditation. That's why the Buddha have give you two stages of meditation, uh, samatha pavana and vipassana pavana. Samatha is calm or absorption. Vipassana is insight. See? So you first need to subdue your defilement. Once you have subdued them, then you then you can look at things as they really are. Okay. So how wave mindful prostration, is it can lead to absorption? Itself? Mindful what? Uh, like prost- prostration. Right? Mindful prostration? Like, like prostate to the Buddha, prostate, the touching, walking. I think something like Tibetan when they walk up and I don't know why you want to prostrate. <laughs> you, it, your mindfulness can you can develop mindfulness without having to prostrate. Yeah. Just be mindful with your normal activity. You know, your walk, you be mindful of your walking. Your eating, be mindful of your eating. Your washing, be mindful of your washing. This is something normal. You know, don't try to do something abnormal. You know, like walk three steps and prostrate, and walk another three steps and prostrate. This is, this is not natural. The, real, the Buddha taught the natural way. In the Satipatthana Sutta, he said, just be aware of your body's activity. Whatever you do, just be mindful of that activity. If you're looking to the left, just be, just be mindful that you, you know you are looking to the left. When you're looking to the right, just know that you're looking to the right. Not looking to the right and think about the, what, you, what you saw on the left, you know. You have to be with the, the body activity. Then this is being mindful. Then you can then control your mind, not to let your mind go here and there. See? And once you can control your mind, then you can send into absorption when you sit down. See? So first you need to have mindfulness. But if you think you're using mindfulness with prostration, okay. If you can have mindfulness that way, it's okay. But eventually you're going to have to sit down and meditate using anapanasati, watch your breath, and then fix your attention at one point. That's the only way that the mind will become totally absorbed, become one. Question number six. Is a blackout while meditation, which means it feels as though there is time missing in meditation without recollection of anything happening, and when coming out of the state, there is a feeling of well-being but also confusion to what happened. So is this blackout the same as jhana? When when you enter into jhana, you disconnect from the body. See, so when you disconnect from the body, you disconnect from the world. You disconnect from time. You don't know what time it is when you're in jhana. You're like floating in space. But after you withdraw from jhana, then you come back to the body, and you come back to the the world of the body. You look at the clock and say, "Gee." Two hours already passed, you know. Sometimes something like that. If you're confused, that's your problem, you know. <laughs> and and that, there's no reason why you should be confused. Just just to know that when you like you, when you go to sleep, you know. When you get up, you come back to the world. When you sleep, you go to another world. You go into the spiritual world when you go to sleep. When you wake up, you come back to the physical world. It's the same way with meditation. When you meditate, you go into the spiritual world. And when you come out of meditation, you come back to the physical world. The difference with, between, between meditation and sleeping is that when you sleep, you don't have any happiness. Like when you have the happiness from absorption. That's only the difference. Because when you sleep, your mind can still think. See? And sometimes you think bad, then you have bad dreams. And when you get up, you you got perspire, you, you, you got all exhausted from your bad dreams. Yeah. So but dreams can be good or could be bad. You know. But if you meditate, it will always be good. Question number seven. I'm also wondering about a meditation state where it kind of feels like sleeping, except there is a weak awareness and the back is straight, so it's not really sleeping. Is this jhana or something else? Well, if your mind is not yet totally concentrated and stop thinking, then it's not yet jhana. Maybe it's one of the jhanas. There are four jhanas, see. 
what I'm talking about is the four jhanas, when the mind becomes totally disconnected from the khandhas. No thinking, no perception, just the mind by itself. That's the fourth jhana. But before that, you can think. Question number eight. Does an arahant still have unpleasant thoughts or are all memories neutral? The arahant can have good or pleasant thoughts good or bad thought, but he's not attached to them. He's not, he's not affected by, the, by those thoughts. Just like when he sees things around him, he sees people die or see people being abused, you know, but his mind is not disturbed by what he saw. It's the same thing with his thought. His mind is not disturbed by what, what his thought might have come up. But usually the arahant will not think of bad thoughts anyway. So I would say an arahant has no bad thoughts, only good thoughts, because that's how an arahant became. He became because he got rid of the bad thoughts, mm -hmm. and he is seeing only the good thoughts. Okay. Question number nine from USA, from Vic Mera. I use Anapanasati as meditation object and can quickly get my mind very quiet as I focus on my nostril tips. I have noticed that mindfulness cut off thinking quickly, but now I have reached a stage where mindfulness appears to start cutting off even perception. And so at times I don't know if the breath is coming in or going out, or even the, if there is any breathing. It's not perception that you lose, it's your mindfulness that you lose. Mm -hmm. If you don't know whether you are breathing in or breathing out, it means you, you, you have no mindfulness mm -hmm. of your, your breathing, that's all. So he asked, is it right or should I back off from mindfulness so that I can be more with the breath? So be more with the breath. Well, mindfulness has to go with the breath in order to, to be aware of the breath. Mm -hmm. So just be aware of the breath, okay. whether you're breathing in or breathing out. Just okay. stay there. Don't go anywhere else. Don't think about anything else. Okay. Just keep watching your breath. Okay. Question number 10 from France, from Miss Adelaide. Is there a Dhamma teacher? who is a Sotapanna in, or a Sotapanna in celestial realm who can teach another Deva in their realms or another realm? See, in order for a person to be able to teach the, the other existence, other beings in, in, in the other world, he first has to have the ability to connect them. See? And some people do have the ability and some people don't. See? So it doesn't mean that everyone who, who has become enlightened can connect to the, the other beings. Some can, some don't. It depends on their past, uh, past experiences. In the past they might have learned how to connect with the other beings. So when they meditate, then they can connect. You don't have to be a Sotapanna or an Arahant to be able to connect to the other beings. All you have to do is to have jhana. Once you have jhana and you can, and if you know how to direct your mind to connect to the other beings, then you can connect. But if you don't know how to con connect, then you won't be able to connect. It's like you might have a phone, but you, if you don't know the number of the person you want to connect, then you cannot connect anyway. You have to find the number of that person before you can connect with the other person. So that also means that even in day one also must have that kind of. Because I think her question is whether a Dewa can teach another Dewa, something like that. This I don't know. I, I don't want to speculate. I'm not Dewa. So. <laughs> 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 okay. Question number 11 from Indonesia, from Miss Aini. Is it possible when we get to Jhana but we don't know that we enter state of Jhana? Well, you might not know the name of the stage of jhana, but you should know that you feel better. Your mind becomes calmer and more peaceful and happy. You should know that, but you might not know whether this is first jhana or second jhana or third jhana. This, you have to go compare with the text, then you will know. It's like when you drive to a certain, on the road, you might not know where you have where you have got to so far, because there might not be any sign telling you where this place, where you are. But if you, if you nowadays, if you have GPS or you have 
a map, then you can open up the map and say, oh, um, I am, I'm right here, I'm right here, see. So it's the same thing when you practice meditation. You might get to a place, you might not know the name of the place. If you want to know what this place is, you might have to go open the text and read. And the text will tell you whether this is the first jhana, or second jhana, or third jhana. Okay. So her next question, to attain to Sotapanna, do we need all four jhana? Is it possible to attain Sotapanna without jhana? It's hard to uh, attain uh, jo- uh, Sotapanna or any level of enlightenment without the support of jhana. Mm. Because you need jhana to help your enlightenment. See? So you need to, that's why the Buddha teaches jhana before teaching insight meditation. First you develop jhana. Once you have jhana, then you develop insight. Once you have insight, then you can become enlightened, become a sotapanna, become a, an arahant. Question number 12 from Penang, Malaysia, from Lee. Can Ajahn guide me in your way of meditation? Well, first you have to be mindful. Start with mindfulness. Be mindful from the time you get up to the time you go to sleep by being focusing on one thing only. Don't think, you know, think only when you have to because as a lay person you still have to work. But you want to eliminate all the other things that you don't have to think about. Like when you get up, just concentrate on your body, focus on your body, follow your body, every every activity, every movement. Don't send your mind to go think about some other thing. Just watch your body. If you're washing your face, just watching your just watch it. You're taking a shower, just watch it. Taking you dressing up, just watch it. Don't so forth. You know. If you have to think, you have to plan, then stop your body activity. Sit or stand and then think mindfully. Think only about the things that you have to think about. After you have finished thinking, then you stop. Then you come back and f- watch your body again. Keep doing this. Then your mind will not roam around. Your mind will not go here and there. Because when you meditate, you want the body to be fixed on one point. So if you have mindfulness this way, when you sit and watch your breath, then your breath, you will only watch your breath. Then you will not go think about other things. And when you can do this, your mind can become calm, become absorbed very quickly. And you will find peace and happiness from this absorption. And then you can then use wisdom to eliminate your desire. Because you have something better than what your desire can provide you with. If you have the happiness from absorption, then you can get rid of everything else. You don't need anything else. See. Right now you need things because you are not happy, because your mind is not absorbed. But once your mind is absorbed, then you don't want to have anything. Because it's, it's, it's problematic when you have something. When you have to go get something, it's problematic. And when you have it, you have to take care of it. And when you lose it, then you become sad again. So you will see the, the, the problem with having things, uh, doing things according to your desire. So then you can stop your desire this way by seeing that it's more, more, more hurtful than more helpful to have, to do what your desire tells you to do. So you, but if you have no absorption, no happiness from absorption, then you have to rely on other things to make you happy. And then you always end up unhappy because the things that you have will change or disappear from you. Question number 13. When I use the word butto as the object of meditation, do I have to follow butto with my in-breath and the out-breath? No, no, just use the, the, the word itself. Don't, don't forget about the breath. Just use one or the other. If you want to use the breath, then don't use putto. If you want putto, don't use the breath. Just focus on one thing. Focus on putto, putto, putto. Reciting putto, putto. If you want to use the breath, then just focus on the tip of the nose. 
question number 14 from Colombo, Sri Lanka, from Mr. Sumit. I'm writing about a point recorded in page 88 of Dhamma for the asking under the title Twins. It refers to the state of mind upon the passing away of an arahan. I would appreciate it very much if you could explain how the mind of an arahan after his passing away can exist and in what, in what form. Well, in spiritual form, see, we have two parts. <coughs> Everybody has two parts, physical and the spiritual. <coughs> we call the mind or the heart. This is the spiritual form. And uh, the physical is the body, see. <coughs> And it's the spiritual form that directs the body to do things. So the body is just a, a servant to the spiritual f part of us. And the spiritual part of us never dies, never extinguished, never disappear. But it has no form of itself. <coughs> That's all. So it used the body as the representative. But once you become enlightened, you realize that having the body is is hurtful to the mind. So an Arahan stop decide not to get a new body. Once the old body dies, the Arahan still exists in the spiritual form, see, with, but having no body, that's all. His next question is, my understanding, Ajahn Mahabhava state, states that the Arahan who has passed away can manifest themselves in the same form that they had taken in the last birth in order for a living arahant to identify. Is it possible <coughs> for such mind to manifest in a form discernible to another arahant? Yes, because when but they only they only connect to the spiritual, not the physical. The person who received this an arahant who passed away has to have the ability to connect to the spiritual world. <laughs> like a Jan Man. When he meditates, he can connect to the spiritual world. And then an arahant who lives in the spiritual world then can connect with him, see. So in the same form, right? It's like, as the he He can manifest in whatever form he wants. Mm. It's just a matter of thinking about it, so, see. Okay. You want to think to be a Rock Hudson, you want to be the Beatles, you can sing and then it's you become that right away, see. Okay. It's imagination, see. Mm. Imagination. I think it's answer his question, whether is it possible for Arahan who have passed away to interact with uh, each other? Yeah, possible. But usually no, because he he doesn't want to bother. He, 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 he has enough already. He leaves everybody alone. <laughs> Let everybody find their own path. <laughs> question number 15 from Indonesia. I have a teacher here, Venerable Utamo, who is a disciple of late Tan Ajahn Thet. But I also want to learn from Tanajan Suchat. My question is how to find the right teacher for developing my Dhamma practice and at the same time have to take care of my 91 years old mom and also have to work to survive. Well, you just have to divide your time accordingly. Give some time to provide for yourself. Give some time to look after your mother. Then give some time for your practice, that's all. You just have to know how to divide your time properly. Okay. Question number 16. I was told that my house feng shui and the aura is not good. With whether I earn, whatever I earn, I will lose it all. Or however good I perform in work, I never get acknowledgement. But I need this job to support myself and my mom. I did a lot of dana and also asked my mom to do the sangha dana. I'm very stressful and depressed. I cannot stand this anymore. I don't have money and I don't get treated fairly in my work, but yet I need a job to survive. Can I just give me Dharma advice on how I can face this struggle in life, both mentally and materially? Materially, you have to be, uh, you have to be thrifty. Only use what you have to have and forget about the things that you don't need to have, then you will, you won't be so stressful that way. What makes you become stressful is because you desire to have more than what you need. Okay? Mm -hmm. So all you have to do is just to have what you need, then you'll be less stressful. Okay? And then also you have to accept your karma, that maybe this is your karma to have to go through this experience. 
But if you can accept your karma, then you, your mind will, pe- will become peaceful and not stressful. Uh, her next question, which is about her bad Feng Shui in her house, which is, I do not want to move out of my house because it will mean that I'm defeated by bad Feng Shui. My question is whether good karma, bad karma and Feng Shui are all interconnected and whether I will be able to break this bad, bad Feng Shui with good deeds. No, the Feng Shui has nothing to do with you. It's just a belief. The real thing that has to do with you is your good and bad karma, that's all. And it's something that you cannot eliminate once you have done the bad karma. Then you have to face the consequence of your bad karma like you are facing now. All you have to do is face it with a calm mind and acceptance. If you can face it with a calm mind and acceptance, then you will not be stressful. You can be happy even though you are you are facing the bad karma. Uh, number, question number 17 from Brooksville, Florida, USA from Mr. Frank Collins. Hello Ajahn. Last time you told me to focus on the breath until I cannot focus on it anymore. Do I do that no matter what meditation object I'm using? No, you, you only use, you do this when you use the breath as your meditation object. If you use other meditation object, then you have to focus on that other medita- meditation object. If you use a mantra, then you have to focus on your mantra. If you use uh, the skeleton as your object of meditation, then you have to focus on just the, the skeleton. What you want to do is to make the mind become still, not thinking. See? So you have to fix it with something, one object. can be anything that you like. Uh, a mantra. If you like Jesus, you can repeat Jesus, Jesus. Yeah. If you like Buddha, you say Buddha, Buddha, Buddha. Uh. If you like focusing on your skeleton, just focusing on your skeleton. If you like your breath, just focus on your breath. Just one thing at a time. So, uh, which is his last question, his second question. Do I focus on the object until everything disappears? And all that's left is the one who knows. Right. When you have that, it means your mind has become absorbed and becomes one. But then you have achieved your meditation uh, practice. Okay. That's all. That's all the question. Yes, sir. I hope all the question that answer is some somewhat clear to you. But if it's not, then you can ask again next time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, of you want to add any question? You happy? Okay, I think then it's time for me to say goodbye. Until next time, may you all be well and happy.